We're pleased that you can all be with us. Before I get started and introduce the panelists, I wanted to briefly show uh, a quick recording of Senator Leahy's recent uh, address to the Senate Judiciary Committee hearing, introducing his idea of uh, constructing a truth commission to investigate some of the Bush administration's policies uh, during its eight years in office. So uh, without further ado, I will show that. To ensure that we have strong national security policies, to ensure we do not repeat mistakes. I look forward to that discussion. The Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy said in the recent Supreme Court decision restoring our great writ of habeas corpus, the Constitution is not, not something that any administration is able to switch on or off and will. So we, we shouldn't be afraid to look at what we've done or to hold ourselves accountable as we do other nations when they make mistakes. We have to understand that national security means protecting our country by advancing our laws and values and not by discarding them. This idea for a commission of inquiry is not something to be imposed. Its potential is lost if we don't join together. Today is another opportunity to come forward to find the facts and join all of us Republicans and Democrats in developing a process to reach a mutual understanding of what went wrong and then to learn from it. If one party remains absent or resistant, the opportunity can be lost. And calls for accountability through more traditional means will then become more insistent and compelling. I held early hearings exploring how our detention policies and practices from Guantanamo to Abu Ghraib have seriously eroded fundamental American principles of the rule of law. I think that we're less safe as a result of the mistakes of the last administration's national security policies. I also believe that in order to restore our moral leadership, we must acknowledge what was done in our name. We can't turn the page unless we first read the page. I do not want to see us in a case where we are lectured the mistakes we made by countries who themselves have some of the worst uh, and oppressive policies. President Obama, Attorney General Holder, and others in the new administration are already hard at work on detainee and interrogation policies to determine the best way to form effective and lawful national security policies. I think a commission of inquiry would address the rest of the picture. With a targeted mandate, it could focus on the issues of national security and executive power in the government's counterterrorism efforts, including the issues of cruel interrogation, extraordinary rendition, and executive override of laws. We've had successful oversight in some areas, in others we remain too much in the dark. People with first-hand knowledge will be invited to come forward and share their experiences and insight not for the purposes of criminal indictments, but to gather the facts. And such a process could involve subpoena powers, even authority to obtain immunity to secure information or to get to the whole truth. Of course, as in any such inquiry, uh, it'd be done in consultation with the Justice Department, and no such inquiry rules out prosecution for perjury. Vice President Dick Cheney and others from the Bush administration continue to assert that their tactics including torture, were appropriate and effective. I don't think we should let only one side define history on such important questions. It's important for an independent body to hear these assertions, but also for others if we're going to make an objective and independent judgment about what happened and whether it did make our nation safe or less safe. Just this week, the Department of Justice released more alarming documents from the Office of Legal Counsel, demonstrating the last administration's pinched view of constitutionally protected rights. The memos disregard the Fourth and First Amendment, justifying warrantless searches, the suppression of free speech, surveillance without warrants, and transferring people to countries known to conduct interrogations that violate human rights. How can anyone suggest such policies do not deserve a thorough, objective review? I'm encouraged that the Obama administration is moving forward.
that uh, pointed question, I want to turn the discussion over to our panelists today, who I'll take just one moment to introduce. Um, if they'd like to come up and sit at the uh, podium while well, I do. Um, our guest today is Professor David Glazer, who is an associate professor at Loyola Law School. Professor Glazer served for 21 years as a U.S. Navy surface warfare officer. More recently, he served as consultant to Human Rights First and as a research fellow at the Center for National Security Law at UVA. Professor Madeline Morris, who most of us know, is the director of the Guantanamo Defense Clinic, among other things, and has been intimately involved with uh, Guantanamo Bay and issues relating to the detention of uh, detainees there. Uh, most recently, she was consultant on the brief for petitioners in Boumedien v. Bush. Um, and Professor John Dugard, uh, who, among other things also, has uh, been advisor to Archbishop Desmond Tutu and was involved in drafting the Constitution of South Africa and the creation of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, so with that, I want to turn it over to uh, Professor Glazier to lead us off with a brief response to what we just saw. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, certainly an honor to be here, um, and uh, I'm looking forward to some very interesting discussion um, with the uh, distinguished panelists. Um, I guess what I was sort of wanted to start off by doing was to just sort of highlight some of the complexities. Um, when we hear Senator Leahy speak, it sounds very, very straightforward, doesn't it? Um, the law has been violated, and therefore, we ought to be interested in getting to the bottom of this. Uh, now, I take sort of a middle ground view, I think, on most of these issues. Um, I have no difficulty concluding that the law has been violated. I have no difficulty concluding that these violations of the law uh, merit follow-up, including potentially prosecution, because of the fact that they're violations of the law. As lawyers, that ought to be enough um, for us. And secondly, my study of the so-called war on terror suggests that we are, in fact, less safe as a nation because of these practices, that we have, in fact, fueled support for the opposition, that we have eroded the universal goodwill that we enjoyed after 9-11. But that being said, I'm enough of a realist to understand that the issues are not nearly as clear-cut as sometimes portrayed, and that there are political considerations that are potentially almost as significant as the legal. First of all, you know, in our system where power shifts back and forth between two parties, uh, it is potentially a matter of, of significant long-term consequences if we create the impression that a party leaves office and is then pursued, either prosecuted or persecuted, by the previous administration. Secondly, I think that while as lawyers, most of us probably agree that the law has been violated, there is a real sense among a large number of Americans that what the previous administration done did was required as a matter of necessity, and that they have in fact made us safer as a result of their practices. And that has real potential to backfire um, if not carefully managed. Second, the legal issues are much more complex than commonly portrayed. Um, I have sort of spent the last few years looking very, very hard at the legal issues associated with the war on terror, and I have yet to find a satisfactory legal account. Uh, people on both sides simply get the law wrong. Uh, and one of the challenges to investigating is deciding what the legal standards are. You know, is this a war? Do we apply the Geneva Conventions? Do we apply other elements of international humanitarian law? Is it the law of war itself that governs customary international law? Is it international human rights law? Um, you know, which provisions of US law apply? These issues are, are very, very complex. And moving forward in an investigation is complicated if we don't know what the legal standards are um, that we're considering. We also have to recognize that there is a difference between international law and U.S. law. And while in a perfect world, one could and should argue perhaps that the United States should closely conform to international law, the reality is that under our system of government and our Constitution, international law in many cases is not directly 
uh, enforceable in the United States. Uh, that complicates things. I think there is risk from an investigation. What if those of us that are sort of critical of what the previous administration has done generally believe that it's made us less safe and generally believe that the claims that we got actionable intelligence through torture are overstated? What happens if we investigate and find out that there are real cases where torture worked and the administration got actionable intelligence through torture? That is a real downside risk um, that I think we need to come to grips with. The other thing is that it, Senator Leahy says, you know, that what we really want to do here is get the truth out and, and expose to the light of day what went on. Well, the United States is party to the Convention Against Torture, which requires prosecution uh, for torture. So are we prepared also, something we need to think about up front, are we prepared to follow through with prosecutions if we do an investigation and develop this information you know, that people are responsible for torture? We also need to think about, I think, sort of three categories of individuals. Uh, and I hope we'll probably talk a little bit more about this in the discussion. But to my thinking, you know, there were first of all the lawyers, the John Hughes and the Jay Bybees who sort of authored the opinions which provided at least theoretically cover for what went on. Secondly, there are the decision makers. And third, there are the folks down on what I as a military person call the deck plates. Uh, the people that actually carried out the, the policies of the government. Now, the irony is that uh, the folks who are arguably the least culpable are probably the people who actually engaged in the acts of torture, believing it was what their superiors wanted, but they are the ones who are easiest to prosecute and are most clearly at risk. You know, arguably the most egregious conduct was by the lawyers who should have known better and should have stood up for the rule of law, and yet they are arguably the most difficult to hold accountable, at least in a court of law. So these are all, I'm not offering any solutions probably, I'm just sort of suggesting at this point that we need to be a little bit cautious and that the issues are quite a bit more complex, I think, than statements like Senator Leahy's portray. And I'm hopeful that in, in discussion, we'll really have a chance to sort of delve into to some of these issues in more detail. Thanks. I think that it would be not just unproductive, but very counterproductive uh, to proceed in the way that Senator Leahy has suggested. You know, it's, I'm surprised that he's actually suggested this because he should know better than anyone that what you do if you want nothing to happen is you set up a committee, right? And then it takes a long time and then events overtake whatever it may be. Sometimes you need a committee either to investigate or to create recommendations. But here, there's so much legislative work to be done that's absolutely clear and that requires no further information, or very little, so that the committee would produce rather little and delay the action that's urgently needed on legislation itself. <laughs> it would allow anybody who didn't want the legislation, and there are many pieces that are required, anybody who didn't want the legislation to go forward to say, well, we have to wait for the report, which would defeat the purpose. Also, it would create more secret documents and certainly the public appearance of secrecy all over the place. Most of these issues would involve information that's classified and necessarily classified and would therefore require closed hearings and then a redacted report from the committee. So it's not as though this Truth Commission to bring the truth to light would bring the truth to light what would bring to light and um, make very, very visible is that it's not being brought to light. It would also be a very slow, very litigated process. There would be claims of executive privilege to be litigated, state secrets, the classification process itself, so that it, while Leahy says, you know, it would take forever to criminally prosecute these, it would take forever to have this commission and during that period of time, there'd be a good excuse for not getting on with legislation that is very identifiable as far as 
the areas in which legislation is needed. The litigation would happen not once if there were such a committee, but repeatedly. First, during the committee process. Second, about hearings that Senate committees would eventually have when they got around to thinking about legislation. And then, of course, once legislation was enacted and there was an effort to enforce it, the issues would be litigated again. If we needed the information, that would be one thing. But we know that we need le legislation on classification and declassification. It's a mess. And there are not a lot that we need to find out in order to proceed with that or any of these things. The Classified Information Protection Act governing the use of classified information in criminal proceedings, and it's been applied some in civil proceedings. Terrible set of problems. SEPA, that act was designed for the situation where most of the classified information at issue would be coming from the defendant. The defendant would say, well, it's fine, you can prosecute me, but I'm going to have to tell these secrets that I know. On, in this situation, it's not just or even mostly that classified information might be revealed by a defendant in a criminal trial, but rather that the evidence that the prosecution would be putting on is classified and the government has a big problem with having to decide between either disclosing this information publicly as evidence against a defendant or not bringing that evidence in and risking an acquittal. SEPA is not designed for that problem. SEPA needs to be amended or different uh, legislation put in place to deal with the new set of problems presented. Regulation of covert operations, CIA operations, interrogation standards. We don't need to find to, to investigate what works in interrogations, not because we know, but because we don't and can't know. We don't know whether torture works. We, and we're not going to find out whether it worked in the instances that President Bush, Vice President Cheney, claims that it did. There's no way that that information would be not classified or not properly classified. And we're certainly not, we can't pursue the scientific method, have a hypothesis and then have a control group when we torture when we don't. There's not a lot we can do to actively go out and find out what works. Unfortunately, what we have to decide is what we're going to do not knowing what works. We very desperately need legislation on detention and rendition. If the two are not legislated together, one's going to replace the other, and we know which one that will be. Disclosure of executive records, the scope of habeas review. We, ha we know we have habeas review. We don't know what it contains. We don't know what other rights, what the substantive rights that are supposed to be applied in, in a habeas review will be. Some maintain that there are no substantive rights. The only right is habeas. Habeas is governed, the scope of habeas is governed by legislation, and we need that clarified. Jurisdiction of military commissions. Military commissions are provided for by law, but not in this new context, and we just really don't know what their constitutionally permissible scope is. It's quite clear that there have been big problems under the Military Commissions Act. And legislation is needed there as well. There's many, there are many areas where legislation is clearly needed and where additional information is not really what's required. What's required is moving forward in a prompt manner, which a commission of, of this sort would probably prevent. In terms of international opinion, it seems wrong to me to suppose that revealing more and more instances of misconduct, more instances of torture, mistreatment, would improve international public opinion. What might improve international public opinion would be an overall recognition that wrong was done, and then a concrete demonstration of a commitment to change things by legislating change not by having a committee. Legislation also would be appropriate on foreign aid and public diplomacy, which, again, would 
contribute more to positive public opinion internationally than further revelation of more and more instances of wrongdoing. Thank you. Thank you. Is this switched on? Yes. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this uh, discussion. I must uh, confess that uh, as a South African, I tend to see any suggestion relating to the establishment of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, through uh, South African uh, spectacles. In other words, I uh, am not uh, obstructed in my view by the niceties and technicalities of the American uh, Constitution. Uh, and, and that, of course, allows me to adopt a broader approach. Uh, the, the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, comprised two features. First of all, it provided for public hearings for truth tellings. And secondly, it uh, included an amnesty process in terms of which uh, persons who had committed serious violations of human rights might uh, ask an amnesty committee, a quasi-judicial committee, for uh, amnesty. I don't think that the uh, amnesty leg of the South African Truth and Reconciliation uh, procedure would be uh, useful in the uh, American uh, context, because quite frankly, I, I don't think it's likely that there are going to be uh, prosecutions. And uh, if there are prosecutions, I think that they would be directed at the small fry that carried out the orders rather than at those responsible for uh, giving the uh, orders. Also, I think one should bear in mind that uh, prosecutions would take uh, a very long time, and uh, so there is some uh, policy consideration that might uh, be uh, considered here against uh, prosecutions. Certainly that was one of the reasons why the uh, South African uh, democratic government approved the idea of uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission rather than uh, prosecutions. Uh, uh, unlike uh, my, my colleagues, I, I tend to th see the uh, international legal standards as uh, as very uh, clear. I, I don't think one judges uh, the legality of torture by whether it works or not. Torture is simply offensive whether it works or not. And therefore torture is prohibited and I think it should be condemned in the strongest terms. I think the Geneva Conventions and the uh, Torture Convention lay down very clear standards and I think it's also clear that uh, many of these uh, standards um, have been uh, violated. I don't think one can uh, reconcile waterboarding or rendition with the um, uh, torture convention. And I, I think that the J. Bybee uh, memo on what constitutes uh, torture is simply uh, contrary to the definition of torture in the torture convention. But uh, I agree with my colleagues that uh, it's unlikely that there will be prosecutions, and I don't think it would be a very wise course to uh, pursue. So, so that one leaves one with the question of whether it might be useful to uh, establish a commission of inquiry, a truth and reconciliation commission. And I think there might be something to be said for this. Uh, I, I would not uh, approve a congressional commission of inquiry or even a judicial commission of inquiry. I think the South African model here is very helpful. We had a uh, commission of inquiry presided over by a very highly respected South African Archbishop uh, Desmond Tutu and a group of other people from different walks of life, church, legal profession, civil society, all of whom were highly respected. In other words, it, it was a genuinely independent commission of inquiry. And I think that kind of inquiry might be uh, very useful. And I would 
suggest that uh, it should be given fairly extensive powers. The uh, Latin American uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, particularly the Commission for Chile, uh, did not allow names to be given. People might not be named for uh, committing violations of um, human rights standards. I think that's unfortunate. In South Africa, there was a naming process. Uh, unlike Latin American Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, we also uh, recognize subpoena powers, and so the uh, police were entitled to, uh, or the prosecuting authorities were entitled to subpoena persons, and they also had powers of search and seizure. And I think those powers are very important. And I, I think one would have to simply uh, uh, provide that there would be no uh, classified uh, information, that no information should be withheld for reasons of national <coughs> security, which I realize is a, a, a far, uh, a, a very uh, ambitious uh, uh, suggestion. But I, I think that uh, a commission of inquiry uh, that uh, had the power to examine the question of whether during the Bush administration there were serious violations of uh, international standards, particularly in respect of the Geneva Conventions and the Torture Convention, might be uh, helpful. I think it would serve to clear the uh, air within the United States, and I do think that as far as international public opinion is concerned, it would go a long way towards restoring the image of the United States. Thank you. May I just interpose one quick question before uh, we continue? Um, given all that's been said, um, and given that there is a strong interest among the public um, in knowing what was done in the past eight years, um, and there's also a strong interest among the public in seeing some level of accountability uh, where international norms and domestic laws have been broken. What, if, if the, po the possibility of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission is indeed too complicated to, to lead to real accountability or to the solutions that those are looking for, what, what, what instrument can we use? I mean, the... The Rome Statute, for instance, of, of the International Criminal Court, while we certainly aren't a party to it, uh, is held to be reflective generally of customary international law and recognizes that willfully depriving a prisoner of war or other protected person of the rights of fair and regular trial is a war crime. That raises the issue of whether we are dealing with prisoners of war legitimately here and whether or not the uh, individuals at Guantanamo Bay are other protected persons. Um, but insofar as this does reflect an expectation uh, among the public, internationally and domestically. What, what opportunities are there, if any? And, um, or, or is it really true that they will just be ultimately frustrated by uh, political realities and by the complexity of the legal situation? Take a shot at that. When you ask what alternatives there are, the question is, for what purpose? So in terms of the idea that we need to know what's gone before in order to know what to do going forward, in my view, the answer to that is you have hearings on legislation and where additional information is needed, that additional information is brought out at the hearings. The idea that you need a separate um, forum in which to examine it uh, seems to me in terms of information gathering, um, well handled within the hearing process, in part because before there are congressional hearings, there's a lot of staff work done so that a committee will say to the committee staff, we need a report on this, we need a report on that, and if they don't have adequate staff, they can staff up, they can have consultants. So we have a way to gather information extensively for Congress and to make it public uh, in hearings to the extent that it can be made public, um, which a lot of this can't and <clears throat> won't. So in terms of the information gathering process to inform future law and policy, we have a way to do that. We're not going to 
if we're not going to if we're not going to prosecute, then we're not going to incapacitate anyone. I don't think we're looking to rehabilitate anyone. I mean, sort of going through the standard criminal law purposes. Uh, the deterrence uh, seems to me is well in place. Uh, the from a political point of view, this did nobody any good and would not be a model to follow. And reputationally and so on for the various people that were directly involved. That leaves retribution. And to sort of have a shaming process where people are called forward, they're not prosecuted, we're not achieving even real retribution in that way, but there's sort of a political retribution and maybe a personal uh, pain and suffering involved with the process itself. I, I don't think that that's a, a good use of the subpoena power or congressional capital or time or money. So I'm not sure what the alternative would be directed toward accomplishing. Uh, and I'm not sure that there are worthy or necessary goals to be accomplished beyond fixing what was broken. And that can happen within a legislative process. I'm going to uh, sort of stick to my probably unsatisfactory middle ground, um, which is probably making me no friends with the audience, but so be it. Um, They're not that great anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I'm in the embarrassing position of these are very, very important issues, and they're things that I study, and so I should have a strong opinion on this, but I, I don't, unfortunately. It's the other way. Um, because I think I sort of see the merits on both sides. Um, I mean, I do think that we've made a lot of mistakes. And I do think that if we're not going to repeat the mistakes, and, and certainly I, I agree, at the, end, at the end of the day, I mean, it seems to me what's most important is restoring our credibility with the world. Um, because I think we need that for political purposes, not just for sort of to feel good about ourselves and have other countries feel good about ourselves. We also, I think, need to agree on a legally sound approach to confronting terrorism because the reality is it's most unlikely that 9-11 was the last major serious terrorist attack the United States is going to experience. And I'm very concerned that if we don't have a legally sound approach identified and agreed to, that when the United States suffers another serious terrorist attack, there's going to be mass public outcry for the government to protect us and people are going to be more sympathetic to the harsh measures that were taken during the Bush administration because, well, at least those people were trying to help us. Um, so I, I do think we have to have a way to move forward. Now, I, I sympathize with the merits of what Professor Morris is saying, you know, that, well, we could just get on with the legislative process and sort of come up with some plans and codify in American law, this is how we deal with detainees, this is how we deal with interrogation, and understand that if you cross these lines in the future, you know, that we are going to prosecute you because you're, you're on notice up front sort of what the standards are. Uh, you know, and that makes potentially some sense. I also am sympathetic to the idea that not airing further American dirty laundry, you know, is potentially helpful. Um, you know, I, I get asked occasionally to comment by the media, and a couple times I've been called by Al Jazeera and asked if I wanted, you know, to speak about some of these issues. And I have regretfully declined. I mean, I think Al Jazeera actually is, is a very, very viable and important media outlet. But I'm not sure that I do anybody any favors to criticize our government, because that's where I come down on most of these issues, in a media outlet that's geared towards people who already have enough good reason not to like us. And there is, I think, a risk from open hearings is that we can, they can backfire in terms of alienating world public opinion. On the other hand, I do think we have to do something to show that we get it uh, and that we're, we're moving forward. And I'm not sure that there is the political support to enact meaningfully new restrictive laws without getting more information out there about what went wrong in this administration and, you know, the need uh, to do better in the future. So that sort of lends itself in favor of 
you know, of some sort of adherence. I, I mean, my perspective, I think the one thing I do feel very strongly about and the thing that I try to address in my own scholarship is I do feel that we need to coherently identify a sustainable and justifiable legal framework for moving forward. Now, unlike Professor Morris, I actually think that we have all the existing authority we need. I think the law of war applied as a complement to existing criminal law gives us the tools that we need, and I think that we can define sufficient legal authority justified in law to give the administration the flexibility it needs to deal with terrorists, and yet able to restore our credibility with with, with world public opinion, essentially. But the problem is, again, getting people to agree to that. So I, I remain, therefore, sort of cautiously agnostic about what really serves our, our interests um, best. I, I'll pause at this stage, let the audience have its say. Okay. Um, are there any follow-up questions to that point, or, or on another topic? Robin. Um, thanks for this panel. Very um, interesting comments by the panelists. Um, I guess I, I uh, have a, a question um, related to uh, uh, Professor Morris and Professor Glazier's comments um, about the difficulties and the sort of the trade-offs and some of the long-term uh, delays that are that you see as. Um, as, as, a, as, as real downsides to either a TRC or prosecutions. And I guess uh, I'm not a lawyer, so um, forgive me if this is uh, out of ignorance, but isn't that what lawyers do? I mean, isn't that the whole difficulty, the figuring out of the law, the investigations? It doesn't seem to be, to me, a negative, but in fact a very necessary positive of working out these issues in a public way in a way that is observant of the law, but in a way that actually puts so many of these issues on the table. I don't see that as a negative. I see that as a very strong positive in a didactic way. Um, and I guess my broader uh, question is, or my broader point, is that it seems to me the downside of not doing anything, of just simply moving on, is, is profoundly harmful to a democracy. Um, if the message is the higher up in government you are, the less accountable you are for your actions, I just think that's devastating. A devastating message for a country that at least considers itself one of the leading democracies in the world. And um, uh, so I think that you know showing the world our dirty laundry is, I think, uh, exactly what we need to be doing uh, in, other, in a way of also teaching our people teaching the citizens of this country what what has happened and what needs to change I mean uh, laws are made partly through invention and partly through precedent and I think you know I personally am disappointed in Senator Leahy for bringing this up I'm a firm fan of prosecutions um, because I think that the TRC as Professor Dugard was mentioning in South Africa is a sign of weakness it's a sign of weak democracy. The TRC was um, something that South Africa chose to do precisely because they could not do prosecutions, because that was politically impossible. Are we such a weak democracy? Are we so afraid of our own political system that we go for a weak remedy like TRCs and not for the strength of actual accountability? Well, that's a very fair question, certainly. Um, and you're entitled to make a squirm, I think. Um, and, and so I applaud you for stating the views so clearly. Um, the, even the prosecution issue, though, is a little bit complex. Because first of all, you know, we look at the lawyers uh, who, in theory at least, provided sort of legal cover um, for what the administration was, was doing. Um, I, I think it was horrific lawyering um, 
but of course that's based on sort of the anecdotal accounts that have made their way into the press. Now hopefully sometime soon we're going to get an actual official report by the Justice Department's Office of Professional Responsibility. Um, and perhaps that is going to, to shed some real light um, on this. And from that then, you know, at a minimum, uh, one can certainly envision professional sanctions being pursued against the lawyers, if not prosecution. But a number of people who I respect, you know, very highly, I mean, I, I think that the lawyers sort of, to my mind, are almost the most egregious because they're the ones who are supposed to know the law and supposed to have known better. On the other hand, I, I think it is a little odd, you know, what are John Yu's credentials in the law of war? I mean, I think they're non-existent. And I, yet, you know, just immediately after 9-11, this is the guy who the U.S. government is turning to and asking him to come up with legal advice for the administration. Um, and the law of war is something that takes a lot of study, particularly if you're going to go beyond the conventions and try to ferret out the customary law of war. It's not something that you're going to come up with the right answer with based on a couple days of self-study. So, I mean, we, we do have to be a little bit sympathetic. Um, and the idea that we're going to prosecute lawyers for, you know, if, if we're talking about prosecuting lawyers for merely giving bad advice, now that's, that's a pretty serious precedent. If on the other hand, the investigation shows that the, the conduct was really over the top, that these folks knew in fact that they were, they were telling the administration what it wanted to hear, perhaps that they'd actually been asked to reach specific decisions rather than actually doing independent lawyering, then certainly at a minimum it's unethical and professional discipline you know, can, can be pursued. Um, for sure. Prosecution, though, I mean, you really have to show that there was some sort of conspiracy or joint criminal enterprise kind of thing in order to really prosecute the lawyers. Now, the decision makers, um, first of all, you're going to immediately alienate a large section of the American public if you go after members of one administration uh, early in another administration. And then the question also will become, you know, did they in fact rely on legal advice, which is certainly the defense that many of them are taking now, or did they really go out in a conspiratorial fashion and pursue faulty legal advice as a cover for what they were trying to do? Certainly if the latter can be shown, then there is stronger grounds um, for prosecution, um, but it's going to be very, very politically divisive. The great irony is that the lower level folks are really the ones that it's very easy to prosecute. I mean, they can be prosecuted by foreign tribunals under universal jurisdiction for war crimes or torture. They can be prosecuted under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, the ones who are in the military for assault or mistreatment of prisoners. They can be prosecuted under federal law for the violation of, of torture. So the people that actually carried out the policies are far and away the easiest ones to reach. You know, but are they the ones we really want, um, we want to go after? Um, so it, you know, it's easy to say prosecution, but it's, it's a lot harder to really implement. Certainly at a minimum, I mean an absolute minimum, I would favor professional discipline against any of the policymaking lawyers that were involved. Now that doesn't sound like much, you know, but John Yu can very easily lose his tenured faculty permit for position and probably will if he's subject to serious professional discipline. Um, you know, Jay Bybee can be impeached as a Ninth Circuit judge if he's found to have seriously breached, you know, legal standards. So it's not toothless. Um, it may be, though, that against the senior political leaders, the best that can be done is basically political stigmatization and loss of reputation. There's interestingly, there's a middle group that I would actually favor pursuing and those would be military commanders and senior military judge advocates because I think those people breached a serious professional responsibility. I think they had to know if they were halfway competent that the orders they were getting from higher authority were unlawful. And certainly the law of war and U.S. law is quite clear that you don't obey unlawful orders. Um, and that 
would be potentially a way to sort of show that we are serious uh, in holding some of those folks accountable and make it that much harder for a future administration to, to launch on a course of conduct like that. So that may sound odd to sort of go after people in the middle, um, but I think there are a lot of folks in the middle who, who knew better and, and should have stood up to the administration, and the administration would not have been able to engage in this kind of conduct without the acquiescence of the professional military leadership who should have known better. Uh, Professor Dugard, did you? Yes, I, I would just like to uh, re respond to uh, Robin. Uh, I must confess that uh, when South Africa had to uh, decide which way to go, I favoured prosecution rather than a Truth or Reconciliation Commission. But I, I think I was wrong for the, the reasons that have been spelled out. I think the, the, the problem is that it's so easy to prosecute the small fry and the, the big fish go free. And that, that's been demonstrated uh, by the South, South African experience because uh, we did uh, provide for uh, prosecution of those who had refused to apply for amnesty. Uh, no military officer or soldier applied for amnesty and no politician applied for amnesty. It was only the, um, the troops in the security forces and the police forces who had actually carried out the torture uh, <clears throat> who were prosecuted or subjected to amnesty proceedings. So I, I do think that one has to take account of that uh, reality. Inter alia, the whole question of uh, command accountability, account uh, command responsibility is just too uh, difficult to uh, uh, establish. And so I really think that uh, a hearing which uh, allowed a broad investigation of uh, the uh, decision making of the political leaders would go a long way towards clearing the air. And then as far as the lawyers uh, are concerned, let me again <coughs> mentioned that in South Africa there was a special panel of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission on uh, judicial responsibility and lawyers' responsibility. And I think it would be very helpful to have an open uh, investigation of the role played by lawyers in the uh, Bush administration, in the process of which uh, some persons would be named and professional action might, discipline might follow against them. But I really don't think that one would achieve anything by going the prosecution route. Was there a question in the audience? Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that I'm hearing kind of from a lot of different angles is a real assumption of an us versus them, 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 and them. And some of those parties, I guess, I would think of as um, the administrative actors that we're all assuming acted badly, which I do too. But so there's you know these bad guys in the government. And then I'm hearing, well, then there are the lawyers. I mean, I, I was interested when Robin asked her question that the response immediately jumped to, how, yeah, how could we prosecute the lawyers? And I thought that seemed a little bit like, an, like a disconnect because I think there are lawyers outside of the government, lawyers inside of the government, lawyers that are advisors. So lawyers are permeating this system. I mean, we have a whole school full of lawyers here, each one of which could probably address answers, substantive answers, like how should we structure a law, how should we go forward from different angles, and as students and members of this community, I'm sure we've all heard a lot of angles on that. So that's, you know, a whole other area of the way lawyers play a role. But more importantly, I think, two of the other thems are the American public generally, who are not lawyers, who don't have an understanding of this the way we do. And there's a lot of, in law school, us versus them talk. I mean, think about criminal law, for example, like, oh, they just don't understand the rules, and you're going to have to talk to your clients, oh, the clients, you know, they don't know anything kind of discussion. But the reason what we hear in the paper, the reason the outrage is there, the reason that Leahy can get up there, and it sounds like a really good thing to some people, that there would be this truth and reconciliation thing is because what we've been hearing is there are all these secrets, there's all this bad stuff happening, and we don't know what it is. And this sea of public, right, wants to know what's going on. And just because we can sit here and say, well, we know what's going on, we know what happened, there were these lawyers, there are these policies, you know, and we should just move forward. If what we want is legislature, and I agree with Professor Morris that, you know, getting on with it and having something better in place is a great idea, but the legislature responds to who? 
right? Like these are all representatives of states and they're political actors and what the C of the public thinks is important to them. And so I don't know what this, you know, what a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, what role that would play in this. I don't know if that would be more effective or not. Um, the other them, of course, is the international community. But it seems like the opinions of all of these people have different assumptions that come with them. And some of them are very educated and see these complexities, but some of them don't. And I, and I kind of take issue with the perspective that we started with that, you know, this is complex and there's a lot of risks, so we should be really careful. I think if torture is effective and that was something that could be discovered, that that's something we should know because then wouldn't we be even prouder of rejecting it because that's still not a reason to say it's okay. I and mean, you know, like these things don't have to be hidden from us for us to make decisions. And so um, I guess if you would like to respond to that, I know it's not exactly formed as a question, but I guess the things I take issue with are one, are we really intending to not be aware of the different groups that are involved in the different knowledge? And two, should we let fear and complexity prevent us from acting, prevent us from seeking the truth? That seems like a really bad reason to avoid truth seeking. Let me just respond to something that you phrased in, you, you had raised in different contexts, but um, the question, well, would we actually be able to get any legislation through? I think the worst combination of things would be bring out all the details, this is how bad it was, but we can't legislate anything, so we're not going to change it. Better to get on with seeing what kind of legislation we can have and hopefully having something in place before the next attack, if there is one, rather than to go into free fall at that point. So there is a time element and if it's not possible to, to get any legislation through, which I, I don't think would be the case, I think it would be big fight and big compromise and so on, but probably better than nothing and certainly better than to do that than to first go forward with um, what would be a big negative PR campaign, so to speak, uh, and then turn out not to have the will to do anything legislative about it. Um, I, again, I mean, I, I think your view is certainly just as valid as, as any of ours. Um, but one of the challenges and one of the complexities we haven't even touched on would be the scope of the inquiry. I mean, I think it's quite clear, right, that torture is something that we would definitely focus on. Um, now, what about cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment that doesn't rise to the level of torture? Um, you know, do we investigate that? What about the military commissions? Um, you know, um, my personal opinion about the military commissions is that they constitute the war crime of denial of a fair trial. So are we going to investigate the military commission um, process? Are we going to, you know, look at general, you know, mistreatment of prisoners? Are we going to look at whether domestic surveillance laws were broken in the FISA? I mean, one of the biggest challenges is going to be, are we simply going to say that everything the Bush administration did is on the table, or are we going to pick a subset of these and define it, you know, that, that so torture will be germane, but FISA violations won't be, and denial of a fair trial is off the table, but some, you know, it, 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 it unfortunately is just horrifically complex. Now, I, granted, these are not principles principled reasons, and maybe this is not, not a good, good reason not to do this. Um, but the issues are just horrifically complex, and just to say we're going to have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, is, is a very, very simplistic thing to say, but much harder to, to execute in practice. Um, and so, you know, what, what exactly are we investigating? Where are we, where are we going to draw the line here? Um, certainly this is going to take years, right? I mean, the 9-11 Commission, I forget, it took how long. Um, that's probably sort of a model that, that many people have in mind. I have to tell you, I mean, I'm a history major. I want to know too. Believe me, I want to know just as badly as you do the details. And I want to know, you know, which of the things that people on the left are saying are true and which aren't, and which things that people on the right are saying are true. I really would love the truth to come out. Um, but I just am, you know, am sort of, I know too much, I guess, and maybe that's bad because it's making me sort of a pessimist or, or naysayer. But I just see these issues as extremely complex. 
Thank you. Uh, I think we have reached our time at this point. We've just had a fantastic discussion. I know that Professor Morris at least uh, certainly has to go. Uh, could we all just have a round of applause for our panel?